we are not ordinary beings we are beings made in the image and likeness of god we are like god we rule over everything sun moon and the stars are at our service everything created except god and his throne everything is under us that's the dignity that god has given to us that is the thing upon which the whole idea of human rights is based bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul worship Amos 6 and verse 4 to 7. Who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourself musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourself with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph, Therefore they shall go captive as the first of the captives and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. Now as you know we've been uh, looking at this great and wonderful truth that God when he made this earth and man and placed him there he set that as a paradigm as a model. He made an earth with all abundance of every material thing that man would need and then made man in his image and likeness and placed him there and there god came and fellowship with him it was there that man was supposed to live with his wife and family and everything this is a model this is a paradigm that's very important before sin came before the world became a different kind of world god originally set it like this this is god's will Uh, he has no different plan than that. That is his will, that is his perfect will for man. Now, I showed you that even after sin came and the fall came and even after life changed, thereafter you read the stories of redemption. God trying to bring man back to himself. 
uh, right after the Noah's flood, you know, and then Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and the people of Israel, and so on. In every case, you'll find that when God redeems people, tries to bring them back to himself, he also tries to bring them back to that condition of affluence and that condition of uh, enjoying the material good things that he put them in in the first place according to chapter 1 and 2 of Genesis. He always tries to bring them back there. And then in the end you see in, in heaven, in the last two chapters of Genesis, you read about it, uh, about heaven, and it talks about how it, it is almost exactly like what the Garden of Eden was in the beginning. So God is ever trying to bring man back into that blessed state, that blessed condition that he had in mind originally when he created man and put him on this earth. But the thing is this, a lot of people say that I'm just, I'm just going through the Bible this time because, you know, people say, well, don't take verses from here and there and uh, just prove your point. You know, does the Bible really say it? All right, we're looking at the Bible. We saw the creation. We saw uh, Noah's flood. And after that, what happened? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and the people of Israel, how God brought them out of the land of Egypt and slavery and brought them into the promised land, the good land flowing with milk and honey. Once again, another Garden of Eden. It's another creation story. Their life was destroyed. It was chaos, emptiness, darkness. God literally recreates their life and brings them back into another Garden of Eden kind of situation. That's the promised land. So we showed all that. But people say, well, what about the books of the minor prophets? You know, the prophetic books. You know, after you cross the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and so on, then there are minor prophets. Now, the minor prophets are those who are, a lot of time, prophesying, prophesying against the wealthy, against uh, the enjoyment of uh, all the material goods, and so on. So you have many passages like that in the minor prophets, and Amos is one of the minor prophets. Now... You want to see a part of, if a part of rice is cooked, you just have to take one little rice and just feel it. You know, you can tell whether the whole part of rice is cooked or not. So I think if you look at Amos, you will understand uh, the rest of the passages. I don't have the time to go through every passage. But Amos is something that we have to look at because those are the harshest words against uh, the enjoyment of wealth and so on that is given in the Bible, if we can show you how to interpret it and understand it, I think you'll have no problem in understanding all the other passages that are there in the Minor Prophets. And that is why I have chosen the book of Amos and dealing with it right now. Now, a lot of people take books like Amos and words like this. These words are, the words go like this, talking about beds of ivory. That means expensive beds. These guys were living in I mean, living it up, as we say it, you know. They had beds of ivory. They stretch out on their couches. Yeah, not just couches, but stretching out couches, you know, where you put your feet up and all that, you know. And it's talking about eating lambs out of the flock and calves from the midst of the stall. I mean, their eating and drinking is very, uh, you know, in a, on a level that is luxurious. Uh, they sing idly to the sound of mu uh, string instruments and invent for themselves music instruments like David. There's great uh, partying going on, you know. These fellows are enjoying life. They have nice place to stretch out, lounging, and uh, they're sleeping in beds of ivory, and they're eating uh, and drinking on a very luxurious level. Who drink wine from the bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments. Not only are they drinking the best wine, they're also splashing on themselves the best perfume of the day. But are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. So they'll go into captivity. They'll, they'll be the first one to go to captivity, he says. And all their partying and their banquets will be done, with, done away with, he says. There's a total condemnation of the way they lived, condemnation of the way they went about enjoying their wealth and the good things that they had. So this is a very important verse to deal with. A lot of people have taken verses like that and they have interpreted it uh, saying, you know, dealing with uh, things like, you know, should we sleep in a bed or in a straw mattress, you know? 
Is sleeping in bed acceptable? Can we enjoy luxuries? Can we enjoy comforts? Can we enjoy good things in life? Can we enjoy good food? Can we enjoy eating and drinking? Can we enjoy good music? This kind of thing they dealt with. They'll take this passage and they will talk from anything to bed to the clothes to we you wear or jewelry you wear or perfume you wear or what you eat. And they say, let's see what the Bible says and they'll go to this verse. Those who want to condemn the enjoyment of good things, they go to these verses. And what they conclude from this is even more shocking. They say, like I said last week, they interpret it and say, here is a total condemna condemnation of wealth and enjoyment of wealth. So beware, Christians. You are not supposed to have wealth and you are not supposed to enjoy wealth. The enjoyment of wealth is wrong and evil. So you should not have any more than what you actually need for yourself. If you had one rupee more, I've heard people say that if you had even one rupee more than what you need, you are a sinner, you are sinning. You don't need that, you should give it away. This is the way you should live. This is the way they interpret it. But is that interpretation right? I will say to you outright that interpretation is wrong and I'll give you the reason why I believe that the interpretation is wrong. In God's sight, it looks to me that in God's sight, affluence is good. Prosperity is good. Abundance of material goods is good. Enjoyment of good things is good. Why? Because it creates the freedom for human beings and makes it possible for them to enjoy three things that God has ordained that man should enjoy. What are the three things that man should enjoy that God has ordained? I've been sharing with you. Dominion. Dominion means all of creation is under man. He must have dominion. He must not be worshipping the creation. The creation is given to him for his use, for his utilization, for him to take and use and receive benefits from it. So he has dominion. So he must exercise dominion. The second thing is even more important, that he, uh, the man was created for dignity. Dignity. Now, dignity is there in Genesis 1 also. Genesis 1, 26 has dominion and dignity also. Where is dignity? It says man was made in the image and likeness of God. God said, let's make man in our image and in our likeness. That's the dignity. Now, based on that, the Protestant teachers in the early days, in the 16th, 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, they began to teach and explain these things. And based on that, the whole idea of human rights showed up. And in these countries that are based on a lot of Protestant philosophy of life uh, are the countries that emphasize the idea of human rights. They believed that there are certain inalienable rights. When we say inalienable rights, that means rights that cannot be taken away from man. Why nobody can take it away? Why no one has a right to take it away? Because these rights are not given by man. These rights are given or man is endowed with these rights by virtue of creation itself. God has endowed man with that. God has given to man these rights which no man can take away. No man has any right to take away. Dignity. Human dignity. What is the human dignity? Human being is not an ordinary person. He's made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, you cannot oppress him. You cannot treat him like a slave. You cannot mistreat him. You cannot estimate him anything lower than that. He's made in the image and likeness of God. Murder is wrong because you're striking the image of God. It is an assault on the very image of God. So, dignity, human dignity... In a society, human beings cannot be oppressed because men are men and women. When I say men, the women should please understand. I'm not leaving them out. Man, according to the Bible, is man and woman. Woman is really a man. Sometimes you see that, you know. <laughs> the man comes out. <laughs> then you wonder, my God, I thought she was a woman, you know. Well, beware, she's a man with the W-O in the front. For the womb, <laughs> man with the womb. So I'm talking about ma man in the sense of man and woman, when I say man. 
So man is made with dignity. God gave human beings, men and women, dignity. Dignity of the highest kind. That man is full, given such dignity that he doesn't even bow and worship any creation. Created things are below man. We don't worship the sun, moon and the stars. We don't worship anything that is created. The sun, moon and the stars obey us. Joshua said, stop there. I have a job here to do. I need sunlight. Stop there. Let me fight the battle. And until the battle is over, you cannot move. And the sun stopped there. When the people of Israel came to the Red Sea, God said, stretch forth your hand and divide the sea. He didn't say, wait, Moses, I'll divide the sea. He said, you stretch forth your hand, you divide the sea. You have the authority. Everything must obey man. Man is over all creation. We never bow to worship creation. We respect creation because it came from God. We know that it is good. So we think the creation is very special. It is there for a purpose. God created. Therefore, it is holy and pure and so on. But we do not worship creation. We are bigger than creation. So don't look at the stars at night and say, wow, you know. First learn to look at yourself in the mirror and say, wow, you know. Me, amazing. See, a lot of people, when they look at the mirror and say, whoa, you know. Because the wow doesn't come. They come up with woes because they haven't read the Bible. They haven't gone to a church where they taught about human dignity and what God has endowed man with. We think stars are better than us. We think sun is better than the moon is better than us. Everything else is better than us. I'll tell you, man is made very special, made in the image and likeness of God. So every Christian, ought, if you're not appreciating the dignity that God has given to you, you've been listening to some other teaching, not Christian teaching. And if you say, yeah, I've been listening to Christian, no, you've not been listening to the proper Christian teaching. Dignity given to man by God. The dignity is that man is made in the image and likeness of God. And therefore, except God, everything comes under man. He is in a, such a special position and place. And uh, he lives with such dignity. Dignity is very important. The dignity means that he lives di with dignity also. Dignity means the man lives with a certain dignity also. How many of you think it's important to live with certain dignity? You know. I want to say this because I have seen actually Christians say, we must live like paupers, you know. We must live like we have nothing, you know. We must not any, have any earthly good things. We must live like that because that is what brings glory to God. That is what is holy and that is what is good. I don't know where people got that. But I've heard people say that. You know, Muhammad Ali, the great uh, boxing champion of the old times, he went to visit Billy Graham one time in his house. Billy, he was invited to visit and spend uh, some time with Billy Graham. And he came there. And uh, he was entertained in Billy Graham's home, uh, which is in a mountain in a beautiful place uh, called Asheville, North Carolina. And he spent some time there, and they told him about Christ and all of that. When he came out, reporters were waiting and pouncing on him, wanting to know what was said and what was done and so on. But the main thing they wanted to know was his opinion about Billy Graham's house. What did Muhammad Ali thought about Billy Graham's house? They said, what do you think about the way the man lives? What do you think about that? And he said, his house looks like the house a man of God would live, he said. <laughs> That's Muhammad Ali. He said, the house look like, looks like a house where the man of God would live. He says, if a person is a man of God, that's the way he ought to live. And everybody shut up, you know. After that, there was this, they were trying to get something bad out of his mouth, you know. Wow, you know, what a nice thing or something like that. But he never said anything negative. He said, that looks like a house that a man of God will live. It's respectable. It's filled with dignity. It is for the glory of God. God will be glorified by the way this man lives. I believe not only a preacher like him, but every 
single person in this church and every church, every Christian ought to expect to live like that with a great deal of dignity. If you believe in the dignity that God has given to you, then you will aspire to live like that. Aspire to live like that. You know. I went uh, somewhere yesterday and I was driving through some area, but there was a quarters, you know. Uh, I mean, in the condition, it looks like it's going to fall down, you know. Literally, I mean, you can see this, you can see the bricks and uh, some of it is terribly damaged and it looks like it's going to fall down and it looks ugly, 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 I mean. So I looked at it and I said, probably nobody's living there. But then lo and behold, everybody's living there. And these are people that are earning well. Uh, they're in uh, nice jobs and so on because they got the quarters, you know but they're still living there. I thought to myself, my God, how can people live there? They earn a lot of money. They're not poor people. You know, how do they live there? They think it's all right. It doesn't matter. As long as you're, you can live for cheap, it's okay, you know. Just live in a dilapidated, uh, you know, bad place. It's no problem. No, see, when you believe in the dignity of man, how God has made you and who you are, you would want to move to a place where you can live with some dignity. Amen? Dignity is very important for human beings, especially these people that can afford it, you know. If you can afford it and you don't do it, I think there's something seriously wrong, you know. <laughs> I don't want to say which place it is. And you'll all go start looking at it. <laughs> but the thing is this. A lot of people don't believe in dignity. Christian churches must talk about living with some dignity because we are not ordinary beings. We are beings made in the image and likeness of God. We are like God. We rule over everything. Sun, moon, and the stars are at our service. Everything created except God and his throne. Everything is under us. That's the dignity that God has given to us. That is the thing upon which the whole idea of human rights is based. That is why you can't oppress a person. You can't treat him bad and all of that. The idea of human rights comes from that. So dominion, dignity. And then the third thing is delight. Delight means that God has given man in the making itself, in the way that God has made man, he has made him to derive pleasure legitimate pleasure and enjoyment from all created things. He's supposed to enjoy. That's one of the ways he has dominion over the creation. He must enjoy the scenery. He must enjoy the air. He must enjoy everything that comes from this earth. God has made this earth for man, and man must enjoy. There is nothing wrong with that enjoyment of all the wonderful things that God has made. I showed you how God made the earth for man to give delight to man. The earth has a capacity to give delight to man. That's why the mango tastes so good. Why? God made it like that to thrill you. When it touches your taste bud, you go crazy. You say, wow, bring me a basket full of that, you know. <laughs> because God has made everything for your enjoyment. There's nothing wrong in it. To, so to say that all enjoyment of every material thing is evil is wrong. That is evil. To say that is evil. Not all enjoyment of all material things is evil. Because the Bible shows in the first two chapters that enjoyment can be good. And God called it very good. Then how can you say that all enjoyment, all prosperity, all well-being... All good things, material things are evil. That's a wrong statement. You cannot say it. There is, therefore, a legitimate pleasure that we can all enjoy. A legitimate enjoyment uh, that is that we have a right to enjoy. We are made to enjoy it. That is what is called delight. God wants us to derive delight from the creation. And we are made in such a way that we can derive delight from the creation. I will rejoice.
I'm gonna lift my voice and worship you. Glorify your name among the nations. Oh, I will rejoice in everything I will give thanks to you. For you have been my help and my salvation. I will rejoice. I'm gonna lift my voice and worship you. Glorify your name among the nations. Oh, oh, oh. I will give thanks to you But you have been my help and my salvation Every step I take I feel your love around me I cannot escape your grace I cannot explain The blessings that surround me I can only say your own I'm gonna lift my voice and worship you. Glorify your name among the nations. Oh, I will rejoice in everything I will give thanks to you. You have been my help, my salvation. I will rejoice. I'm gonna lift my voice and worship you. Glorify your name among the nations. I made a choice to offer up thanksgiving, lifting up your holy name. I will lift my voice, come before you sing with sacrifice of our praise. Worship you, glorify your name among the nations. Oh, I will rejoice in everything I will give thanks to you. But you have been my help and my salvation. Everybody, oh, I will rejoice. I'm gonna lift my voice and worship you. Glorify your name among the nations. Oh, oh, oh I will rejoice. Everything I will give thanks to you But you've been my help You've been my help and my salvation But you've been my help 